Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I was just looking up, um, checking a reference this morning for something that Shakespeare said about Machiavelli. So what do I do? Google, of <laughs> course. I could not live my life without Google. I couldn't begin to do that. So thank you all very much for existing. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation. Well, uh, here we've lost him now, but that was Machiavelli. And among philosophers, Machiavelli is unusual. In fact, I can't think of many other examples in that we've turned him into an adjective, haven't we? So that you might say of someone, well, that was rather Machiavellian. Um, I'm not sure that we always know what we mean. That's what I was looking up in Shakespeare. He says, of course, he, he makes the infamous Richard say, I could send the murderous Machiavel to school. So he's murderous. Um, but many different things are meant by talking about Machiavellianism. So I thought what might be useful is if I were to try to do something which is quite difficult, which is not to ask what we might mean by this, but what did Machiavelli mean by it himself? And I'll try to do that by way of talking. I'll just talk for half an hour, just rave on at you, and then we can talk together, I hope, which will be um, more interesting, I think, for you. Um, I'll try to do this by talking about the book that I think people most often, have, most often have in mind when they talk about Machiavellianism, which is his book, Il Principe, The Prince, um, completed in 1513, first printed in 1532, and of course, not long after that, it becomes, as it has remained ever since, an absolutely global text. And even if you write about him, you become a global text. So just briefly to boast, this little book is currently available in 25 languages. Um, and of course, uh, that is simply the global name. I'll start by saying a word, if I may, about Machiavelli's life, because that's extremely important in relation to his political philosophy. So he's a Florentine. He's born in 1469, son of a lawyer. All that's known about his early life is that he has a good classical education, which in those days meant learning Latin to a very high standard. I mean, he writes, he's bilingual. He writes in Latin as well as in English. And, and often, of course, when he's writing legations, uh, he's writing effectively in code, um, writing in Latin rather than in Italian. They're on the cusp of Italian, but of course, they've already had Dante and Petrarch, and so they have a great literary language to which he very spectacularly contributes himself. So there is his education. Um, the first that history hears of Machiavelli is in the year 1498. So um, France invades Italy in 1490. The Medici, who have been informal um, tyrants of Florence for the last 50 years, they quite soon get thrown out, and the traditional Florentine Republic is restored. And from nowhere, Machiavelli, still only in his 20s, becomes the second chancellor of the Florentine Republic. He has no previous administrative experience that's known about. Actually, quite a lot of research has been done on this because the Archivio di Stato is good in Florence, and you can find out quite a lot about Machiavelli's entry into the chancery. But it comes from nowhere. But he is second secretary, and as... Um, Second Secretary, he ranks as one of the secretaries to the Chancellor, Piero Soderini, who is a friend, um, in consequence of which he is sent on a number of diplomatic missions. And that's what's important in relation to his political writings. The first is in 1499 to Caterina Sforza. I mention it because it's important to remind ourselves, especially in a book that is, I have to say, very heavily gendered, in its thinking about politics, that in order to be a prince in Renaissance Italy, you did not have to be a man. And Machiavelli is extremely impressed and actually rather cross with Caterina Sforza. She turns out to be a very difficult person to negotiate with. So that's 1499. And then in 1500, he is sent for the first of four trips that he makes, long trips, to the court of Louis XII of France. And on each of these occasions, he has a number of audiences with the king. In 1503, he's sent to cover the papal election. The Borgia Pope, uh, Alexander VI, has died, and um, he is succeeded by Julius II. Machiavelli meets, of course, both these people, and he subsequently has several meetings with Julius II. And then in 1508, the last of his really important legations, he's sent for six months 
to the court of Maximilian, the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, he's met the Pope on many occasions. He's met the King of France on many occasions. He spent several months talking to the Holy Roman Emperor. This explains a certain tone about his politics. He's the insider. He knows what's going on. He's met the leaders of uh, Western Europe of the time. He really has. And they all, of course, reappear in the pages of the prince. Louis XII, typical Frenchman, doesn't understand statecraft. Uh, Julius II, bonkers. Um, Maximilian, hopeless, useless emperor, uh, never can decide anything, doesn't know what he's doing, nobody knows, nobody can trust him. So there's a loftiness, of course, about the resume that he gives all these people, but my point is simply, um, he is the insider, and that's a truth about him, and he wants you to understand it. All right, then, so the final phase of his life stems from Julius II with typical impetuosity, trying to get the French out of Italy, allies with the Spanish. That brings the dreaded Spanish infantry into Italy um, and the whole of the area held by the French, which is roughly the line in the Po Valley of the great cities, including uh, Milano, and, of course, Firenze is an ally. They are under enormous threat. And to stop Florence being sacked, they simply surrender um, the Republic collapses, the Medici princes are returned. So Machiavelli is out of a job permanently. He goes into retirement in to his, his farm south of Florence. I don't know if any of you have seen it. He complains a lot about it in his letters, but if you go there, I don't think you would complain. It's an absolutely lovely house in San Andrea. Very good restaurant there as well. Um, so he is there until his death in 1527, and the outpouring of literary works, none of which, of course, he expected to write. He was going to go on being a major civil servant of the Republic. But um, he writes the Discorsi on Livy. He writes uh, The Art of War, which is published in, I mean, printed in 1521. He writes The Florentine Histories, which a huge work occupies him the last five years of his life. But the first work that he writes after he loses his position is the prince. And we know a lot about the, the writing of the prince because he's in correspondence with a friend of his, Francesco Vettori, um, about writing it. So he, it's, it's a wonderful letter and recently described as the most famous letter in the Italian language. Um, he says, you know, I'm living in this terrible hole and I'm not in Florence, but I'm, I'm entering the courts of the ancients and asking them to tell me their wisdom. And I've written a little book about it and it's called, actually he says, De Principatibus, but he, he writes it in Italian and it's completed uh, by Christmas of 1513. Now, of course, all these books, a mirror for princes books, this is a book of advice to princes, they have dedications, and the usual dedication will say, well, you're amazing, and I'm nothing. Machiavelli's dedication is extraordinary, um, it's, uh, 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 from a literary point of view, because he says to these Medici princes, to whom the book is dedicated, first to Giuliano, um, who dies in 1516, and then to Lorenzo, it's rededicated in 1516 when he revises it. He says, look, you're new princes. You don't know anything. I've been doing this for many years. I really know what's going on. So listen up good. It's, I mean, it's an extraordinary um, uh, address to a prince in the Renaissance. You don't talk to them like that. But this is Machiavelli. And then there is a concluding exhortation to the Medici. She says, look, you've got back into power. And there's a great metaphorical account of how Italy is bleeding, um, Italy is wounded, so of course the metaphor is Italy needs doctors. Well, he doesn't have to because he's echoing it. What is the Italian for doctors? Medici. So he's addressing the people whom he thinks will be the doctors. So they need advice. What advice do they need? Well, Machiavelli has two answers, and one is a high-flown one, which is, brings us into the heart of Renaissance moral and political ideals is, what is it to be a prince? It is to seek glory and posthumously fame. Of course, fame is in the hands of the historians, which is why you must be polite to them. But for the moment, what you're seeking is to do what Machiavelli calls gran cose, great things of such a kind as will give contentment to the people. They'll be amazed and pleased and they will bring you honor and glory. But he says that's not, of course, the basic thing that you have to do as a prince. The basic thing is, and here's a little phrase that echoes all through the Principe, you've got to mantenere lo Stato. Lo Stato in modern Italian, of course, just means the state, but it already does for Machiavelli. Very, very early instance, in the very first sentence of the book, he says, all the states, that's how he begins, tutti gli stati, 
all the states which exist, and he says they're either monarchies or republics. So he has the idea of a state as an apparatus of government, meaning an apparatus of government. But of course, in addressing a prince, he's also saying, look, you've got to maintain your state, i.e. your standing, your status, um, your state as a prince, your princely state, as we would say in an old literary phrase. Um, because, of course, if you lose your princely state, you will have lost your state as well. So the question is, and notice that there's a little piece of French echoing here, isn't there? The coup d'etat, the blow against your state or standing as a ruler. How do you avoid that? How do you maintain your state? That's the question. Well, there are two basic answers, I think, in this book, The Prince. And one, this is, again, a very um, Renaissance apposition. It's an apposition between two great powers or forces. And one is for fortuna, one is fortune, and the other is virtu, however we translate that. So we begin with fortune. So Machiavelli, uh, of course, he doesn't say this, but he's the kind of political philosopher who thinks the idea of a science of politics is ridiculous, because politics is actually all about statecraft. It's not about institutions about which you might have rules and even predictions, and it might begin to look like a science. But he's saying, no, this is about leadership, and this is a book about leadership. Um, and so the first thing that you have to understand if you're a political leader is you need so much luck. You need buona fortuna. And you need luck in all sorts of ways. First of all, you need to suit the times. Chapter 25, which is the chapter on fortuna, says if you don't suit the times, you're ridiculous. And of course, you know, the, the figure of Cervantes is not far off, is it? You know, someone who, he, he doesn't know, nobody goes around on a horse rescuing maidens from castle. We don't do that anymore. You know, you're looking silly. So Machiavelli has this profound sense that you're going to look silly unless you suit i tempi, the times. And sometimes he seems to think the times is going to do everything for you. You can be swept away by the times. But you could be someone, he says of Julius II, the Pope, look, this man was actually crazy. Um, but the times were exactly right for him because he was utterly impetuous. If he needed to moderate and think, then, of course, the times would have been um, hopeless for him because he couldn't do that. But he suited the times, and that's why he succeeded. But there's a second way in which even very great polit political leaders need luck. Uh, and this takes us into a particular passion of classical and Renaissance philosophy, the idea of, of Time is not just duration, but also timeliness in, in the Greek kairos. You remember it from Ecclesiastes, there is a time for this, there is a time for that. Machiavelli has this very strongly in mind. There is a time even for great leaders. And the idea of a mute inglorious Milton is always there. You could be a great leader, but no one has ever heard of you because the times didn't require it. And he gives the example of Moses. He says, well, of course, Moses cheated because he had this great help which nobody else has had in politics, which is this, this person, you know, he says, come up the mountain, I'll tell you what to do. Um, so Moses has God, but above all, the Israelites are enslaved. There's no leadership of them unless they're enslaved. So that was a bit of luck. Not a bit of luck for the Israelites, but a tremendous piece of buona fortuna for Moses because he had the chance to display his great powers and duly did. Thirdly, Machiavelli doesn't, of course, use this phrase because it's a piece of modern American slang, but you can get lucky. And it's very important in politics to know how to get lucky. Notice there's a distinction, um, as there always is in Renaissance philosophy, between fortune and fate. Fortune is a power that is susceptible of alliance. You can do something, as we would say, commercializing the idea, you can make your fortune. But that's the underlying idea. Of course, he doesn't mean make money. He means make glory. That is making your fortune. So you have to know how to make your fortune. What are the qualities needed? And he has, in his great chapter on the power of fortune in human affairs, chapter 25, he has two metaphors. One is highly objectionable, but I'll have to mention them both. The first is la fortuna, he says it's come, what is it like? It's come un fiume, it's like a river. So the force of the metaphor is that's treacherous. He's thinking of the Arno. You go to Florence in June, the Arno is almost empty of water. You go after the Alps have melted in March, and it's an absolute raging torrent. So he's saying, look, 
you're going to have to embank this river, but it's no use waiting for the winter. You've got to embank it when it's empty. So the whole point is foresight, prudence. That's how to get lucky. The other and highly objectionable um, to us metaphor is famous in Machiavelli, la fortuna è una donna. Fortune is a woman. That's to say, this is an arena of conquest. You're trying to win. Um, so there's the male-female principles, which are, do somewhat underlie the text. And there the point is, Machiavelli says, um, be audacious. In his very last letter, Machiavelli, reflecting on his own life, says, and it sort of summarizes this part of his philosophy, it's always better to have done something and repented than not to have done it and repented. So there's the idea, go for it, is that's how to get lucky. You won't get lucky unless you go for it. You may not get lucky, but you may get lucky. That's what it's like. La fortuna e una donna. Okay, so there's fortune. But in opposition to fortune, and this is, you, you find this iconography all over uh, the Renaissance buildings of, of uh, Florence, don't you, is virtus, the Latin, against fortuna. In Italian, virtu. And this is the figure of the virtuoso. Uh, and in a way, we, we, we talk about a virtuoso still, don't we? But we mean, well, of course, in general, we mean something who can do something absolutely amazing in public. And that's what Machiavelli means, of course. That's what a prince is, is someone who can do amazing things in public. That's to say, has this quality. Well, what is the quality of virtu? It is this quality. It is, with complete consistency, the name of that set of qualities which enable you to deal with misfortunes, to ally with fortune, and to rise to glory while maintaining your state. It's the name of the qualities that do that. Okay? However, you'll want to say, yeah, but wait a minute. What are those qualities? What are those qualities? Now, to understand Machiavelli's Prince, I think you have to see that his answer to that question takes the form of a commentary on the Roman moral and political philosophy that he learnt at school. And if you think of this book as a book about Cicero, you won't go far wrong. There are two great moral philosophers who uh, uh, would have been studied by Machiavelli in the greatest detail. And the first is Cicero, and especially the book called The Deificis. Um, I mean, it was said, you know, uh, movable type printing in the West is invented in Germany in the 1440s, and what do they do with it? Well, they print the Bible. But of course, it comes to Italy only less than a generation later, and what do they do? They print Cicero. So there you have the difference between Germany and Italy in the Renaissance. Um, and Cicero's book, the, called Deificis, concerning duties, your offices, what, what, what is your, the duty of your office? This Machiavelli would have learnt his Latin by reading. OK, what does Cicero tell us? He says, well, look, there are four virtues, and they're the so-called cardinal virtues, and they are the cardinal virtues of antiquity. They are prudence, that's to say practical wisdom, uh, and courage, temperance, and most important of all, and especially in politics, justice. So Cicero focuses on justice. Now, justice is the distinctively human virtue. That's the first thing he wants you to know. I mean, animals have courage. Of course, and they, they might even have temperance, who knows. But uh, they don't have justice. And so injustice is unworthy of humankind. And Cicero loves these metaphors. It's brutal. You're being a brute. It's beastly. You're being a beast. You're not being a man. So notice man, woman, but also man, beast. Very important um, in, the, in, the, um, in the layout of the metaphoricality of this work. And so there are two forms of injustice. Uh, one is using force instead of law. And of course, what's beastly about that is which is the animal you're imitating? The lion. That's the image of pure force. Or, even worse, and contrary to justice, is fraud. And which is the animal you're imitating then? The fox. The fox is the symbol of fraud and guile, just as the lion is the symbol of strength. Both are brutal, beastly, not humane, not human. So there's the first thought. The second is encapsulated uh, in the English uh, proverbial phrase, honesty is the best policy. Always be just. Why always be just? Well, in politics, 
uh, Cicero really wants to stress this, you're on a stage. You are seen by everyone. They, they can see what's going on. You, you're always on display. So you've got nowhere to hide. That, that's the thought. It's public life, and that's the force of the image. You are in front of an audience all the time. So you better behave. And if you don't behave, your sins will find you out. Now, to that thought, Christian writers on how to, to advise princes, and I'm thinking of someone like Aquinas' um, Education of the Christian Prince, um, add, yeah, but there's a much more important reason why you must always be just, which is that there's a day of judgment. And if you have seriously sinned as a ruler, that will be declared at the day of judgment, and you will be penalised, and then you'll be sorry that you weren't just. So it's always, here's the thought, it's always rational to be moral. Okay, so there's Cicero. The other figure I need to say a word about, very, very important for the political theory of the Renaissance, is Seneca, because Seneca writes um, under Nero two very important moral treatises about politics. And one is called the De Beneficiis, the Be on Concerning Benefits, which is about non-contractual relations. And here the fundamental virtue is not justice, but generosity. And the great thing about generosity is it's better than justice. The second uh, text he writes is called De Clementia, Concerning Mercy. And again, this of course he's writing under Nero, so he's writing in praise of monarchy. Um, monarchs can be clement. Laws can't be clement. Laws have to be just. So clemency, again, it's better than justice. So you have these two so-called princely virtues. Okay, now I, I want to say now, um, think of the prince as a commentary on all of that. Now, if you think of it as a commentary on the four cardinal virtues, um, Machiavelli, he doesn't speak up for temperance, does he? But we've seen him speaking up, um, because he prefers impetuosity, I think. But we've seen him speaking up for prudence in relation to the fume and courage in relation to la donna. But what he mainly concentrates on, and these are the central chapters of The Prince, both uh, politically speaking and also physically speaking. Chapters 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. It's a book of 26 chapters. The core chapters are, Machiavelli says, introducing him in chapter 15, how should a prince behave towards other princes and his subjects? He always says his, but of course he will have Caterina in mind. The prince, uh, their subjects, as we would say. So he's going to concentrate on the princely virtues, liberality, um, and clemency and justice. Okay, so what does he want you to understand about these? The first thing he wants you to know is that we live in corrupt times and we often misunderstand the virtues. And he thinks in Renaissance Europe, the virtue of liberality is misunderstood. People think it means giving enormous gifts to a small number of people. Machiavelli says, that's not liberality, that's extravagance. Extravagance is the name of a vice, not a virtue. So you've misunderstood the virtue. The, um, the other cardinal, not cardinal virtue, the other princely virtue, which is crucial to Machiavelli uh, in misunderstanding the virtues, uh, is clemency. He says, well, now we think we're very civilized, and so what we think is clement is just not punishing. But he says, that's, that's not clemency. That's being troppo facile. That's, that's being too easygoing, I suppose, would be the best translation. And at this moment, amazingly, he mounts an attack on the most impeccable of the Roman heroes, Scipio. And Scipio was famous for his clemency, you remember. Um, and his clemency was most celebrated in Spain when his army um, mutinied. And he forgave the mutiny. No one was punished. So what happened? They mutinied again. So Machiavelli says, so that wasn't clement. That was just stupid. So we misunderstand the virtues. And underlying this is a, a passion in Renaissance culture. Shakespeare is obsessed by it, that you can always manipulate the terminology of virtue and vice. So I can say, well, um, to take some of Shakespeare's examples, that, that, that was a very cautious act. So someone would say, well, that wasn't cautious. That was avaricious. Or, well, that was really courageous. And that wasn't courageous, that was just reckless. So the whole of moral language can begin to look fuzzy in this way. And Machiavelli is saying, well, we are indeed a victim of that fuzziness. But 
The main thing he wants you to think about is justice and what he wants you to know, and I'm going to come to a close shortly, and so I'm going to turn to the text because I really need to read exactly what he says, is it's not that we misunderstand justice. We must misunderstand the role of justice in political life. Now, here you are, you're a prince. What's your basic task? Remember, it is mantenere lo stato, to remain in power, not be taken down. And of course, to use your power to do great things. And hovering is an almost impious thought, the power and the glory. You're using power for glory. But then he says, look, wake up. This is an unjust world. If you always behave justly in an unjust world, you will lose your state. And I want to quote now, because what I want to show you is that this which is almost the most central claim that he wishes to make, is laid out as a parody, I think satire, on Cicero. <clears throat> Everyone knows how praiseworthy it is for rulers to keep their promises and live uprightly. Nevertheless, his favourite phrase, non di manco, no rules, I mean there's always an exception, nevertheless, experience shows that in our time the rulers who have done gran cose, who have done great things, have held the keeping of their word and the maintenance of justice of little account. I say there are two ways of contending. One is by law, but the other is by force. The first, it's true, is appropriate for men, and the second for beasts. Notice all the Ciceronian story. But the former is insufficient, so the prince must have recourse to the latter. So a ruler must know how to imitate beasts as well as employing manly methods. Since a ruler must know how to act like a beast, he'd better know which to imitate. And I say he should imitate both the lion and the fox. A prudent ruler, therefore, is not going to keep his word, and nor should he, when that will endanger his stato. This advice would not be good if men were good, but they are not and will not keep their promises to you. So you should not necessarily keep your promises to them. It is those who are best able to imitate the fox who succeed best. So the basic Machiavellian rule, I put it's very simple, uh, it's at the heart of the book, and I'm going to quote at the very beginning where he lays it out when he says, I'm now turning to how princes should behave, chapter 15. There is such a great distance between how we live and how we ought to live that anyone who sets aside what is done for what ought to be done learns more quickly what will ruin him than maintain his state. A man who wishes to make a profession of doing good in all things will be ruined amongst the many who are not good. Hence, if a ruler wishes mantenere lo stato, he must learn essere non buono, the Italian says, he must learn to be not good, to act contrary to justice. So there's the fundamental claim. However, there are two supplementary Machiavellian rules. One is you must only act like this if it's necessary. This is, this is not advice to a mafia boss. This is advice in extremis. That's to say, where it is indispensable to preserving your state, you must be willing to act against the dictates of justice not otherwise. Secondly, and of course this is where Machiavelli's notoriety arises, you've got to seem to be good. That's very important. You can't always act well, but you must make absolutely sure that it looks all right. And let me quote where he says that exactly. A ruler then need not possess the princely virtues, but he must seem to. Indeed, I shall be so bold as to say that having and always cultivating them is harmful, but seeming to have them is indispensable. You must seem merciful. You must seem trustworthy. You must seem upright. But if it becomes necessary to refrain, you must be prepared to act in the opposite way. But notice if it is necessary. Otherwise, you must always seem. Well, there, in brief, is the story, except that, of course, there are, as we saw, going to be classical objections to that and Christian objections. 
The classical objection, you remember, is it's always rational to be honest. I mean, honesty is the best policy. It's rational to behave justly because you are on stage as a leader. People are going to see everything you do. They'll soon find you out. What does Machiavelli say about that? Well, he says, I'm going to quote again. He says, this is extremely naive. In these days and in these matters, men judge more by their eyes than by their hands. Everyone is capable of seeing you, but few really touches you. Everyone can see what you appear to be. No one much has direct experience of how you really are, and those will not dare to challenge the popular perception. With regard to all actions, but especially those of rulers, men pay attention to the outcome. They're not really going to ask, is this an honest presidente? They're going to ask, how is the economy doing? If a ruler contrives, therefore, to conquer and preserve his state, he will always be judged honorable and be praised by everyone. So he's saying, don't be naive about that. Politics is about outcomes. But remember the Christian objection. The, the final and most important one is there's a day of judgment. You, you got it all wrong. If you act like this now, that's going to be disclosed. You're going to be punished eternally. Don't do it. So what does Machiavelli say about that? Nothing. <laughs> and that silence at the time would have been the most amazing thing about the book. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Thank you very much, Quentin. Um, you mentioned the concept of shame and the idea that if you, you may have to do shameful things, but you should present yourself as not having done those, yes. those shameful things. Obviously, we live in a world where you, know, you might argue that politicians are doing things that would previously have been embarrassing to them, and it, it's being put onto the public stage. We know when they are being hypocritical. We know when they have done something in their personal life that's embarrassing. And yet, to some extent, they are living with their sins and yeah. maintaining their position. Would that have surprised Machiavelli? Would it have... Yes. Well, he's quite cynical about this. That's a very good point to raise, and he doesn't have a subtle answer to it um, because he thinks that most of this classical moralism is quite naive and that um, it's actually because it's not really true that you're on the public stage. Here's the point. Cicero is writing about a Republican politics. You're in a representative assembly or you're meeting the people. Everything is indeed in public. But he's saying, look, that's not how it is in modern politics. You're actually living in a palace. You've got guards. You're, you, you've got a big security service. It's, you're, you're out of sight. Um, and this uh, actually allows him a further thought, which is the absurdity for Machiavelli of the classical idea of decorum in public life, and especially sexual decorum. Uh, and, and he says, well, I don't see why we're worrying about this. This is not going to cause you to lose your state. You're living in this enormous palace. You're paying these people. If they start to tell on you, you'll fire them. They know that. They won't. They don't, don't, you don't have to worry about that. And so there's this idea that the, the politics of modernity is not the politics of the republic. It's the politics of the closed space. It's presidential politics. It's absolutist politics. And then your worries just don't arise. It's naive to think they do. Of course, in republics, it's different. But he's writing for monarchies. Yes. You started off by uh, quoting Shakespeare and, and obviously making him real in our time. How did his name persist over centuries? Machiavelli's? Yes. Well, um, yes. It, it's an interesting development. When this book is first printed, um, there's no difficulty about printing it. And it, it's printed in, first in Rome and then in Florence. 
and then it begins to be printed all over Europe. It's not until the papacy panics in the Counter-Reformation and sets up an index of prohibited books. The very first person to appear on the index of prohibited books for opera omnia, everything he ever wrote is prohibited, was Machiavelli. And so in a way it's the papacy who invents the murderous Machiavelli. And then he appears as a figure on the Elizabethan stage, if we're talking about the English language case. Shakespeare is very aware of him, um, but he's aware of the sort of um, Machiavelli who Marlowe puts on the stage. Um, uh, and the figure of Iago, of someone who seems to be motiveless in his malignity, has sometimes been thought of as Machiavellian. But what it's come to mean by then is simply uh, um, having no morality at all. Whereas I'm trying to say, look, this is someone who is a classical moralist, critical of certain naiveties of classical moralism. And so he is a profound moralist. It's just that it's not a morality that um, gels with Christian morality at all. On the contrary, uh, it's really an anti-Christian morality. So um, there's the early modern story. And then Machiavelli is rediscovered. The Machiavelli, I haven't had time to talk about. You'll have to invite me back, uh, which is why he gets a gigantic tomb in the 18th century in Santa Croce and is um, widely worshipped in the Risorgimento, is the Machiavelli who wrote the Discorsi, in which he says, look, you can either live freely or you can live under a prince. Now, he says that in the first sentence of the prince, but he doesn't go into it. He says, I'm writing for princes. But he is a Republican. He is a profound believer in self-government. And it's not exactly democracy, because, of course, it's, it's going to be the enfranchised, who are a, a small subset of the total population. But they will enact laws for themselves. And that ideal of self-government uh, in a republic as the proper model then turns Machiavelli um, into a hero. First of all, in the 17th century, in the English Revolution, where all the Republicans read Machiavelli. So Milton um, uh, and Harrington uh, and Sidney and all the heroes of English Republicanism, Machiavelli is the hero. Absolutely the same in the American Revolution. It's Machiavelli's Discorsi, which amongst others is the founding text for the American Revolution. Because he is the person who says, if you're subject in any way to a monarchical power which is arbitrary, you are a slave. That's what slavery is. It's being subject to somebody else's will. And that's the beginning of the discourse. He's saying, if you live under a ruler, you're subject to their will. But that's slavery. Slavery is being subject to someone's will. You, you must only be subject to your own will. But how can you be subject only to your own will in politics? Well, by governing yourself. So it's a story about democracy or at least about republicanism, a radical republicanism. So that became extremely important in the English Revolution and in the American Revolution. And then, of course, the 19th century story is one of the Risorgimento. I mean, get rid of the Austrians, get rid of the monarchy, set up a modern republic. And, and um, so Gramsci and, and others make a hero out of Machiavelli's Principe as the person who sees what it would be to have a sovereign state, which was um, nonetheless a self-governing state. So it's a complex story, but I mean, the irony is, I think that the, the, the murderous Machiavelli is an invention of the papacy. <laughs> of course, Machiavelli detested and despised the papacy. Uh, and he says at one amazing moment in the Discorsi, writing in 1516, this institution is so corrupt that I cannot but imagine that some enormous cataclysm is about to hit it. Of course, he's out by only 10 months. Luther. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you were talking in the beginning about, you know, um, how he was uh, starting to write the book and that he dedicated it to the to the Medici. Yes. And you've just been saying how sort of the perception changed over time and so on. But how is it perceived at the time, sort of for the people he was writing it for? Yeah, was very there good. any sort of yeah. reaction of the Medici, yeah. maybe even to how he dedicated it to them <laughs> or, yes. you know, how they were perceiving this at the time yeah. or of other leaders? Very good question. And from the Machiavelli's perspective, it's a bitterly disappointing answer. He writes the book as a book of advice. It's almost a job application. He, he, he's been very, very senior official in the Republic. He wants back into power. You know, he's had, I don't know if any of you have seen his offices in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. I mean, they're very spectacular. He's very important and they're well worth seeing. Um, so he's out of all that. He wants, this is his passport back. And so he first, um, 
tries it on Giuliano, but he's, he, he dies in 1516. And then it's going to be presented to um, Lorenzo. But Vettori won't do it. Vettori, um, who is back in the regime and is important and is a very close friend, uh, just won't talk to him about it. He says, well, I've read your book. And then he, he won't say anything about it. He's horrified. Um, and so it's never presented. And he dies without it being printed. Uh, it's not quite clear how it comes to be printed, except that his wife, who's much younger, outlives him by 25 years. And she will have had all the manuscripts. And then it, it is put into print almost immediately. And of course, it's a sensation straight away, of course. Um, but it's never, it never does the job that he hoped it would do. Thanks, Quinton. Does uh, Machiavelli specifically talk about trust? You, you framed uh, um, sort of something similar around being honourable, but does he explicitly explore the concept of trust itself? Yes, that's a good question. Um, he does in as much as he thinks, and he says at one point, he, he's not a great political psychologist, but he says at one point in The Prince, look, everything I say is predicated on the assumption that people are not to be trusted um, and that you cannot expect trust. And he's often thinking of treaties. A treaty will be kept, especially by the French, if and only if it suits the French to keep it. Otherwise, it won't be kept. And that's the hard truth about politics. So um, trust, of course, in Latin fides is, in the classical tradition, held to be the foundation of justice. And of course, the watchword of, of the law is fides sit servanda. Good faith, trust must always be kept. And you could therefore say, um, and it wouldn't be much of a stretch, that this is a book about how that's, that's really not going to work. That really is not going to work. And I think another extraordinarily shocking moment for, in the book is one that we can't readily recapture, is in the book, although it's written in Italian, the chapter headings are in Latin. And chapter 18 in the Latin um, takes up this question, uh, which is Cicero's um, phrase, but of course it's, it's almost a proverb. Fides sit servanda, trust, good faith, keeping your promises, must always be kept. And Machiavelli's chapter heading is, quo modo? Fides sit servanda. How, how far should we keep our faith? Well, if you're reading that, I mean, no wonder the book's an immediate sensation. You can't believe that chapter, Henry. What, what do you mean, how far should I? But that, for him, is the whole point. But, of course, he's not a theorist of trust. And here, uh, later writers on the science of politics, and especially, I think Hobbes probably has him in mind in Leviathan, when he introduces the figure of the fool. And the fool is the person who saith in his heart, there is no justice. Uh, I'm now quoting Hobbes. And he says, look, this person cannot be allowed into any corporation, into any civil association at all. Because what this person has just proclaimed is that they will tell you they're going to meet you for lunch at one, but you've got no reason to think they will. But this is someone you can't contract with. But if you can't contract with them, you can't have any social relations at all. So that view of Machiavelli's became, of course, um, a, an extremely polemical one. And um, the natural law tradition is there to say, actually, that's really a huge mistake about politics. And the question of whether it is or it isn't, of course, we continue to debate. Thank you so much for coming and for sharing your thoughts with us. It's very interesting. Uh, my question is, we're, going, we're living through a very interesting time politically everywhere, you know, Latin America, Europe, the US. And I just wonder, if Machiavelli was alive, what would he be thinking about the leaders we have, you know, some of the more exciting or interesting yes. world leaders? What would he be, I don't know, saying to people close to him, for example? Yes. Well, he is a fierce moralist. Um, and his morality is, however, completely consequential, always. So uh, he doesn't think that there are inherent goods. He thinks that you have to judge whether something was politically good by the consequences. He never says the end justifies the means, 
But he does at one point in the discourse, he say, ends can excuse means. So he's talking about Romulus and the founding of Rome and the fact that he killed his brother when they disagreed. And that's fratricide. So he says the deed accuses him, but the outcome, which was the founding of Rome, which rose to rule the world, excuses him. So he's a complete consequentialist. He's also someone who has a passion for not seeming naive. So he, would, he likes not to be shocked. Uh, and indeed, he's very reluctant to feel shocked. That just seems to be a feature of his personality. So I don't think he would be shocked by our politics. I don't think he'd be surprised by our politics. Um, but he would definitely think they're extraordinarily corrupt. Because the foundation of corruption is putting your interests, sectional or personal, or party or corporate, above the public interest. That's what corruption means in Machiavelli. Because unless you put the public interest first, there will be no success of running a civil society. That has to be run in an uncorrupt fashion. And that's really the central um, doctrine of the discorsi in talking about democratic politics, which is what he is talking about there, is how easy it is to corrupt people. And that's why he's a great enemy of the rich. He says the rich will always bribe you. Um, and that's what the Medici did. They found out who was sitting on all the committees, and they went round and said, how about um, a, a big loan? Um, the bank, and of course, they, of course, the bank went bankrupt because they did this so much, but they corrupted an entire political community. Uh, so, and we still say, don't we, bribery and corruption, bribery being the example of it. So he's a great foe of that. Um, and he, he would think that um, issuing manifestos before a general election where you have no fiscal means to produce the results of your promises, that just is corrupt. And that is completely untrustworthy because you're telling people things which you know you're not going to do. So he would not be surprised, but he would be very shocked by us. And he'd be right. <laughs> Thank you very much. My question is, to perhaps try to understand what is it that happened to Machiavelli during his life that he was, uh, he, he was so bold in the way he wrote and kind of so extraordinary even. Yeah. Not only back in the day, but also we still are kind of moved and shocked yes. then about the way Yes, he isn't it interesting? I'm not a psychologist and I can't say that there is a biography of him that plumbs these depths very well. Um, it's understandable that he should have been a passionate Republican. He'd served a Republic. He believed in self-government. Uh, he wanted it restored. Uh, and so he is, in that way, an, a strong anti medicean And he suffers an appalling misfortune at the collapse of the Republic in 1512, when he's mistakenly supposed to have been part of an anti medicean conspiracy. And he's imprisoned, and he's horribly tortured. And that must have marked the rest of his life. I mean, it must have injured him ser seriously, but also it just must have marked him psychologically. But I think that it's the psychology of someone um, who is, amongst other things, a satirist. I mean, in a way, what I presented you with this morning was a satire on Cicero, wasn't it? The lion and the fox. And he picks up all the phraseology and he turns the whole thing upside down in the name of the fact that this is naive and this is unrealistic and this is not politics. So he's someone who's passionate about, about politics and about a kind of political realism. And he's passionate about um, a republic. But of course, he's living in an age of princes, so he's a disillusioned person. So I think of him as disillusioned and melancholy and satirical. There's a very great fictional portrayal of him by George Eliot in Romola. I don't know if you know that book. It's not one of her greatest novels. But Machiavelli appears quite prominently fictionalized in Romola. And it's an absolutely brilliant portrait of him. And in it, um, they, they meet in a barber shop, and they're always talking about politics. And he's, every time he speaks, it's an epigram. and. Um, then someone says to him, well, you're just completely cynical. And George Eliot makes Machiavelli say, and I quote exactly, my philosophy is for anyone who can see beyond their own nose. That's all it is. 
But if you're self-interested, that is not seen beyond you. And so it's a big demand. Yeah, thank you very much for educating me today, certainly reminding me of having read that book too long ago. But if I may just end with a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek yes. comment. In today's day, he's already been raised slightly, but how would he have seen the Brexit conversation and what would he have interpreted from that? Yes. And would you care to guess which way he would have leaned? <laughs> well, he does not have um, a, a constitutional theory in The Prince. There are two great works of politics by Machiavelli, 1513, Il Principe, and then a much larger work written between 1515 and 1518, the Discorsi, which are discourses on Livy, that's to say the history of Rome, that's to say the celebration of the Republic. And there he says, self-government requires a republic, um, and it requires a particular kind of constitution. And he says, look, the only way that you can manage it is to divide power. Um, you'll always have the popolo, and you'll always have the grandi. So it's a class politics. The grandi are the, the rich, the mercantile rich, and, of, of course, the landed rich. And then there's the popolo. So he says, all right, they're both going to have to have an assembly. And he's thinking of Rome. There's a senate for the grandi, and there's the tribunes of the people. But he thinks, no, you should have a concilio grande, which is, a, which is why in the great republics of Italy, especially in Florence and in Venice above all, you come upon these gigantic rooms. Why? Well, because that's the popolo. It's got to be able to assemble. It's going to debate war and peace. It's going to debate taxation. Thousands of people will be present. They're going to raise their hands or not. Um, and that's self-government. So Machiavelli says, all right, but they're never going to agree. The Grandi will have one view and the popolo will have another. Right. Law must be only what they both agree to. Don't try for a law where half of them don't agree. That's never going to work. So he says it's a paradox of politics that if you want liberty, you need conflict because you need conflict of the orders. But the conflict of the orders that produces liberty is that neither gets its own way. So the laws are a series of compromises. Uh, and he says, you know, otherwise it's not going to work. And why is that? Because you'll get very big minorities and they're pissed off. And very big minorities are always pissed off. And that's very dangerous. All true, by the way. These are good questions. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Good to you. No, thank you. Terrific. Thanks very much.